LOL. This ever... <laughs> LOL? Really? You LOL books? Oh, that's horrible. Why, hello. You can learn a lot about someone by looking at their bookshelf. They say you can learn a lot more by actually talking to people, which is why I'm talking to people about their bookshelves. I'm Joel Stein, and this is Show Your Shelf. Today's guest is Layla Lalami. She's a Pulitzer Prize finalist. She has a PhD in linguistics. She's a creative writing professor, and she's written this amazing new collection of essays, Conditional Citizens, about what it's like to be a Moroccan American in the United States whose citizenship feels questioned at every turn. Honestly, I'm a little nervous to see her bookshelf because she speaks a lot of languages and the books are gonna be from all over the world and I'm gonna feel provincial and small and I may lash out. Show your shelf, show some spine. Dust off your tiny jackets, show me yours, I'll show you mine. We're delighted to have you with us. Perhaps we appear pretentious, but we're sincerely here to share the wealth. So show your shelf, show your shelf, show your shelf. Layla Lalami, thank you so much for coming on Show Yourself. You've written this brilliant, beautiful new book, Conditional Citizens, which I truly enjoyed and gets at so many things that I am worried about, not just for our country, but for the whole world right now, about, about what it's like to be an immigrant. Uh, so thank you for coming on. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. That is a good looking bookshelf. It seems like it's organized in a very particular way. Do you have, do you have an organizational structure for that bookshelf? It's organized alphabetically. Uh, <laughs> I know, shocking. <laughs> this is the fiction, yeah, so it's organized alphabetically by author. Is it organized alphabetically by title within author or do you draw the line there? Oh, well, let's not. <laughs> I know I'm crazy, but not that crazy. No, it's just alphabetically by author. This is The River Between by the Kenyan writer Ngugi Wathiongo. This is his memoir. This is called Dreams in a Time of War. So here he talks about having been imprisoned as a young writer in um, Kenya and writing his first book on rolls of toilet paper. Someone else famously wrote their book on toilet paper too, right? There's a lot of great literature that was written while in prison, including one of my most favorite books, Don Quixote. I was working on um, a novel that's set in the 16th century and I was trying to sort of educate myself about sort of the language of, of the era and I wanted to know what people back then sounded like and I went back to the masters. So for example, Cervantes, I think he, in this book, he has characters say things like, I had too many fish to fry. How many languages do you speak? I speak, uh, I speak Arabic, French, English, and I, I manage in Spanish. So how many of those books are not in English? Well, you can't see it, but at the very, very, very top, um, there is a shelf where I put foreign language books. I feel like this is, goes against everything I just read in your book. They're like <laughs> conditional citizen books. <laughs> they have to be banished to a separate area? No, 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 they're not banished There's to a separate area. There's borders in your no. bookshelf? No, no, they are carefully organized by language and alphabetically. It's a, way, it's a way to find all of the books more easily. Do you write in books? Do you highlight? Or do you never touch a book? I used to be the kind of person who never touched books. I would not even put them on the ground. And it's only when I started writing very seriously uh, that I started writing in them. And now I can't imagine not writing in books. I have marginalia in everything. This is one of my favorite books. It's called The Sympathizer by Viet Thanh Nguyen. I wrote ha ha ha. <laughs> I guess I oh, that that's as good as it gets as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> LOL. This ever... <laughs> LOL? Really? You LOL books? Oh, that's horrible. I'm, I'm back to you should never let them touch the floor. So we asked you to pick three books that have had a great influence on your life. Let's talk about J.M. Katzia's Waiting for the Barbarians. When did you first read that book? I was in the States, so it would have been in the 90s. Uh, it says original publication date is 1980, and so it took a long time to get to me because I found out about it in the 90s. By the way, I never think that books are late. You find out about them right at the right moment in your life. Well, okay, that's part of the premise of this show, which is that um, the books that are most special to you have to do with the fact of when you read them, where you were at at that point. 
So why did you need this book at that moment? I'm gonna say I was thinking a lot about foreign interventions and colonialism, and then this book came, and it was, it's basically an allegory. It, it, you don't know what country it's set in. So it, it, you can read it like sci-fi, you can read it like an allegory, and I was born and raised in Morocco, which uh, was a colony of France between 1912 and 1956. When I read it, it clarified for me a lot of my own um, history, uh, both as a person, but also as a as a sort of um, a subject in a in a country. There is an empire, and this an guy unnamed like, empire with an yeah, unnamed magistrate. Unnamed. Right? It's just and yeah. it's a it's a slim book. It's what maybe like 160 yes. pages or so. Uh, 140 in this edition. It's not a long book, uh, and it's it's a very quick read. And so the, the way it opens is that this guy shows up at the outpost of the empire and he introduces himself to the guy who's kind of in charge of the outpost who's named the magistrate and he says that he has come because he has heard that there is there are rumors of a rebellion that that the barbarians are rebelling and he is here to investigate as the book proceeds you see that this guy the the guy who has come to investigate starts you know to use torture on the prisoners just to extract confessions um, and there is no rebellion and this book is uh, unfortunately ever relevant you could read this and it could apply to something that happened in morocco it could apply to something that happened here with indigenous people it could apply to south africa and basically the idea is that when you create uh someone that you conceive of as a barbarian or a foreigner or an alien it is a way to basically project all of your own weaknesses onto them so much of your book is about what you project onto the other the foreigner that you're afraid of in yourself. Right, right. It's looking at the experiences of people with one another that form a nation, and it is looking at the experiences of these people um, toward the state, like the, basically the government, um, which is supposedly accountable to us. You picked uh, a book called, and this is my high school French here, Le Passé Sans. So this book is in French. I do not know if you want me to read en français. <laughs> oui, très intéressant. Je suis très impressed. It is about a family where the father is kind of like uh, like a patriarch. He's very serious, and the son is is a teenager and he's rebelling. I read this book when I was in middle school, and it was one. It was very in middle school. That seems precocious, doesn't it? I mean, don't forget, like, I went to a French school. It was, you know, it's, it's, English is <laughs> not my first language. When a country is under foreign influence, it, it disrupts everything. And one of the things that uh, France disrupted when it colonized Morocco is its educational system. When I was little, all of the books that I read as a young child were in French. So there were books that, uh, didn't particularly show people like me. They were showed French people in French situations <laughs> and uh, French society. And so really books didn't start to speak to me until I was in middle school and started getting introduced to Moroccan writers. There's like a new English translation that came out of that. Yeah, which I'm not like thrilled about. It's not the greatest translation. Poor Drish Raibi, he deserves a little bit better, but. I want at some point in my life to say, it's not a great translation. That would make me feel so smart. Isn't it funny? No, no, the fact that you've never had to say that only means that you've had all of the books that you've ever wanted to read available in your language. One of the books you picked is Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. By the way, everyone we've talked to, maybe to a person, has picked a Toni Morrison book. Do you know why? She is a writer's writer. There's a certain freshness of language in her work. Like, like when you read a sentence or a paragraph by Toni Morrison, it doesn't feel like it's a paragraph that you've come across before. Like the language is just fresh. Then there's her particular ear for how people actually speak. And, and she has a way of kind of like rendering that in her work. Her characters are very well drawn. And one of the things that she does that I personally can never do, and therefore I admire even more because I can't do it, is that in terms of how her narrative unfolds, 
it just unfolds in a non-linear way. Like her plots kind of like move and circle and go back. You don't get lost, but it does not move in a sort of a traditional linear way. And and I like that a lot about her. What what from her writing do you has worked its way into yours? The way in which she makes her characters the center of a story without additional explanation for people who are not familiar with whatever uh, a culture they're coming from. In other words, she's writing about these characters the way that they see themselves. They would never explain their own traditions or their own folklore or their own uh, food or anything. They wouldn't explain it because it's their lives and that's how she writes about them. It's by centering these characters and I think that those of us who are not from the, the majority right, there is an intense pressure to do a lot of like explanation and she avoids that altogether. And I think that that's very important for all of us. And, and I think that that's something that has stayed with me. It's been a big help to see it on the page done so beautifully. Because you're getting all this pressure from society to explain what kind of tea one drinks in Morocco or whatever the thing is. Because in your book, there's this moment when you're like at a reading about your book and then someone asks you about ISIS. Yeah, I mean, and that's right? not, and, and it's not just, it's not, these are not questions that just come from the audience, but they come also from within publishing. Let's say that you are like, that I, I have a, a paragraph about something that may seem unusual, oftentimes it will be the editors themselves that would want to add like in between commas, you know, you know, fill in what this means and you have to resist that. Or at least I have to resist that, <laughs> Joel doesn't. <laughs> so I think that it is a pressure and I think it's because of the, the power play between the people that you are writing about versus the, the sort of context in which the book is coming, which is why, you know, uh, books that, that kind of interrogate power in our society are so important to me. How do you push back against an editor who wants you to explain something in a way that probably takes you out of the story? Well, you, you, you fight, you say no. Getting your sort of creative vision out into the world, it always involves um, advocating for yourself and standing up for that vision so that by the time it actually is out, it is the truest that you, you can make it under the pressures of um, market capitalism. Is there a section of Song of Solomon that you uh, happen to have taught or know or? There are so many, so many sections. You see a lot of check marks when you read Toni Morrison. Um, what else have you written in there besides check marks? Here it appears I have written that between this paragraph and this paragraph, no break to signal break in time. See page 16 for the beginning of this anecdote slash flashback. So I'm leaving a note to myself that we enter the flashback on page 16 and we now have exited it left that flashback and there's no overt way of signaling it to the reader again in like a way, line break or, a, or yeah. something to make you and, pause and, and realize and that's that things because, are changing yeah and that's because the narrator the the character is kind of just they had a flash, like there's just remembered something that has been narrated for us and we're right back into the scene. One of the things that I always talk about is like really effective writing always does more than one thing at a time. And here she's doing multiple things at a time and it's of course written beautifully. And I mentioned earlier that, you know, she's obviously writes this, wrote this influential books of nonfiction and she was an editor at Random House. So she just had like a huge influence on the culture and on literature. And I think maybe that's why so many writers mention her. I got you a gift. And uh, so not to give anything away, but it's a book. And <laughs> we, I wanted to pick a book and I'd never met you before. So, so this is my guess as as to what book would kind of personify you. Oh, wow. The best that, I could. that is big. Should I go? Yeah, I know. I put is? a lot of pressure on this gift. Oh, that is so nice. Invisible Man okay. by Ralph Ellison. Because I feel like you really explain to me uh, and, and to readers what it's like to feel uh, ignored and othered and like people aren't seeing you as a person because they're so focused on on your race or your religion or your, or your gender and, uh, and, and to fight against that like he tries to do, you more successfully than that character, but 
part. Thank you. I love this book. And of course, you know, it has one of the most famous opening paragraphs, right? It's amazing, right? It's just, the, the first third of that book is, just doesn't stop. It's so powerful. Thank you so much for being on Show Yourself and revealing uh, so much about your, your multilingual shelf that impressed me so much. Thank you.